some people are using helmets that are very old and are not up to current standards of protection. Is that true? Well, I would say here's a, here's a really heretical idea that I've heard from some folks, which is go without helmets. Oh, how awful. And <laughs> I, I, it's, I hear what you say, and I, I think that the initial response would be the same. But frankly, the, the way that the theory goes is that if you remove the helmets, then people actually get nervous about the impact with which they're playing a sport. Look, for example, at rugby and say, you know, this may be a sport where the, the, the collision speed is turned down because people are less protected. Now, I don't advocate that, but I would say um, that's, that's just one idea that's out there as this problem goes forward. Well, you're the doctor, but uh, <laughs> as a host, I wouldn't recommend that solution. Yeah. Yeah. And we well, had someone on a couple of times ago uh, a group that goes to the schools to fit the helmet to the child uh, in case there are bicycle injuries. Sure. Because there can be bicycle injuries too where a helmet will save the yeah, child. Yeah, our, our trauma program provides free helmets to, to kids who don't have them for bicycling for that reason. Not is this everybody, a trauma program through Cottage Hospital? It is. It's a local yes, program. That's that what we had on. That, yes. Exactly. That uh -huh. if your child doesn't have a helmet, right. we'd be happy to help with that. And they're donated through our foundation. Um, and helmets do help, and I, I think clearly, you know, in your in your trauma, yeah. you know that that is a direct impact of, of your head. And yep. Airbags and side airbags and helmets. I, I wouldn't say I was just interested uh, introducing a kind of a, <laughs> a thought that is actually out there. Uh, well, I would like to uh, help our parents, our grandparents watching us uh, understand what to look for. If the kid comes home, if your kid comes home and is acting a certain way that's different, what should they look for to be aware that this might have happened to your child? Yeah, I, I guess it's, um, as I said, it's kind of vague. So uh, thoughts about lack of concentration, headaches, um, either sleep, sleeping too much or maybe not sleeping enough. Irritability. Now, a lot of this sounds like teenage activity, so it's going to be hard to sort out. And it doesn't have to be associated with a blackout, uh, and it doesn't have to be sort of an observed event, because uh, a lot of times there isn't a collision that somebody remembers. Say, for example, in your introdu introduction, that football player they were saying suffered a concussion. <laughs> I look at that tape and said, based on the contact that he had, I'm sure he suffered multiple concussions mm -hmm. during the course of both the first game and the second game that weren't recognized or adequately managed. I would like uh, the folks watching us to get a chance to see an example of someone else who had a brain injury and the technology that is apparently in, in development. Uh, to see what can be done about this and ask for your comment afterwards. So, Jared, if you're ready in the control room, let's take a look at that other person with a brain injury. Dan Stunkert walks with an uncertain step. His left hand doesn't work, and he's never sure how high he can lift his left arm. That's about the highest I can go. But he has a clear understanding of why his body changed following a traumatic brain injury and what may or may not be possible in recovery. It's a clarity that has eluded most TBI patients until now. In August of 2010, Stunkard was in an ATV accident north of Pittsburgh. He wasn't wearing a helmet when he was thrown off the vehicle. I had to be brought back two or three times before I even got put in a helicopter life flight. He awoke from a coma three weeks later, paralyzed in his left leg, arm, and hand. He questioned his future. I didn't know whether I was going to be able to ever work again or anything, hold my kids. He soon got answers from an experimental MRI-based test under development at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. It paints a picture of the brain using high-definition fiber tracking. The imaging and analysis differentiate and bundle the various brain fibers responsible for different parts of the body. In TBI cases, this test shows if specific fibers are broken or missing and can quantify how many. That gives neurosurgeons like Stunkards a much better understanding of brain injury and its long-term effects. This was something that finally, at last, was a technology powerful enough with a sufficient degree of resolution to show us exactly what has happened to the white matter or the connection parts of the brain. With standard MRI predicting TBI recovery from a mild concussion or a coma-inducing blow, 
was a guessing game. It frustrated Professor Walter Schneider, who developed the technology, which is in its initial testing. It's unacceptable to tell somebody, there's something wrong in your brain, there's some swelling, and you will never work again in your life. We want a much more detailed diagnosis. In Stunkert's case, high-def fiber tracking showed significant damage to the parts of his brain seen in yellow that control his left, initially paralyzed limbs. A portion of fibers are missing when compared to the uninjured opposite side that controls the right limbs, seen in green. And the fibers that control my hand were 97% missing, and the ones that controlled my leg were 67% missing. Close. Okonkwo predicted Stunkard wouldn't regain use of his left hand, but could, with therapy, walk again. That's exactly what happened. Okonkwo and Schneider say high-def fiber tracking can help tailor rehab to speed recovery, but also manage expectations. I just kept thinking, you know, 97% gone, I'm not going to get it back. They're working with the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, who will soon scan soldiers with TBIs. In as little as three years, Schneider says high-def fiber tracking could be more common for kids who fall on the playground, athletes on the field, or anyone needing answers after accidents. Tim McGuire, the Associated Press. Uh, gentlemen, uh, do you have a comment on what we've just seen? Well, we're doing something similar at UC Santa Barbara to look at functional magnetic imaging. So I guess what they're sort of pointing out there is that most of these concussions, these injuries, are things that wouldn't be seen on the imaging that we have available, and we need better imaging. And so a number of places are looking at that, including uh, our own local uh, university, uh, Santa Barbara, is uh, looking at how to find injuries where our current imaging techniques don't have that availability. Mark, tell us something more about how you developed from your injury and what happened with you. Well, I, that's a, a long question, <laughs> a question with a long answer. Um, I uh, was able to recover from the coma and go home and went through the wonderful journey of um, learning how to walk, how to crawl, how to walk, how to eat, all of those things again. I actually was talking to somebody the other day that um, probably best described what my parents went through. And she said to me, she said, you know, I had an injury and my mother raised me twice. Okay. And Did you have to learn to talk again too? I, I, talking was not a challenge, near the challenge that the physical moving, mm -hmm. um, walking was. But it's been a wonderful, been a tremendous positive in my life. It has turned me... Well, well, the comment that you just made, what your mother said, I think is very applicable to a lot of people because it's my understanding that this kind of brain injury, when it happens, it's not only the young person who gets it. The whole family can be devastated. They can be devastated financially. Uh, family ties can be stressed and f broken because of it. It's an extremely serious problem. And I would like to be sure to leave the people who are watching us with some cautions by knowledgeable people, what they should be careful of, what they should watch out for, what they should know. In a nutshell, Dr. Kaminsky, what would you like to tell parents and grandparents? Sure. Coaches as well. If you have a suspicion that your child, your grandchild had suffered a concussion, then the best thing that you can do is rest. Um, if you had an injury to your arm again, you would put it in a splint and not use your arm. If you have an injury to the brain, you need to have quiet activity to let your brain repair itself. Does that include a lot of sleeping? Because I thought if you had an injury, one should walk and not sleep. I think that the issue for most of the young folks is they feel, as we've discussed several times, invincible. But they shouldn't be texting, they shouldn't be <coughs> driving, they probably should focus on concentrating on schoolwork. And if they're able to do that, then add athletics to follow. Um, you really should have a graded return to activity, focusing on simple things, doing nothing to begin with, and then adding the essential things back before you go back to full activity. Well, we of course have been t talking about athletes, uh, football players, baseball players in school, so forth, but my understanding is that even cheerleading nowadays, cheerleading used to be, you know, uh, jumping up and raising your hands and giving a shout. Now they're, they're throwing people up in the air Gymnastics. and coming down. <laughs> so is. that the risk uh, in cheerleaders is, uh, can be severe, am I right? 
Yes. I, I agree. You know, the uh, gymnastics of cheerleading have evolved dramatically, and it is a dangerous sport, albeit fun, a very dangerous. And similarly, uh, if they suffer a head injury, they should be treated like the football player that is injured on Friday night. It's no different. We need to be very cautious, identify the symptoms, and then slowly return to activity as your injury permits. So what we want to see is for students themselves who are playing, for the parents and grandparents of those students, for the teachers who are encouraging them to play, for the coaches who are teaching them, everyone to be aware of what can happen with a concussion, how dangerous it is, and how it must be dealt with carefully. And what I would like to know is how can a community or people community know which radiology department to go to that has the latest equipment? Just ask. <laughs> well, I think most of this is, most of the injuries that we're going to see are going to be mild and hopefully self-limited. And so, so we're looking for ways to protect those kids from the second impact. The more severe injuries that will require imaging usually present themselves a little more obviously. For example, your injury right. um, is one that we would know that would need that imaging. So I think the, the tip of the iceberg is the severe injury, but there's this whole area underneath of it of mild, in, mild injury which needs to be treated but aggressively. But when you have to have x-rays or MRI or whatever, uh, should one just try to find a place that has the latest equipment? That is my question. Oh, right sure. Now. You know, for example, locally we have a concussion clinic through Cottage Hospital through the trauma department. And I think that also with Cottage Rehab, we in our local community are universally well aware. So I think you need to um, trust your local physicians. Most of us try to stay well informed. And uh, if you have any questions, the trauma centers are usually the thought leaders where it comes to brain injury. We have less than a minute and a half uh, left. Gentlemen, is there anything else that you'd like our uh, viewers to know? Well, thanks for the opportunity. I'd like to mention that on September 17th at 6 p.m., uh, Cottage Rehabilitation Institute will be uh, hosting their annual empowerment series that will feature ex-Hall of Famer and Los Angeles Ram Jack Youngblood talking about how to play safe when it comes to brain injury. And that's going to be where, when, at what time? At Fess Parker's Doubletree at 6 p.m. We'd like to see you all there. On what date? September 17th. It's a Monday. All right, gentlemen. Th thank you so much for being our guest today. This is an extremely important topic as far as I'm concerned, and we appreciate your being here to discuss it with us. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.